All right, welcome back. In this video, we will talk about coupling constants, hydrogen hydrogen coupling constants, so the JHH coupling. Um, and we're going to look at an alkene example specifically to see how we can um, assign the peaks to each individual hydrogen. Uh, normally, this would be a pretty difficult task if we didn't have this value. So you'll, you'll see after this example how uh, the entire process takes place and how can, it can aid us in identifying the specific peak that we have. All right, so the first thing that needs to be mentioned is what kind of values do we expect to have for these coupling constants? The coupling constants, just to remind you, represent the energy difference in, in terms of frequencies. So and notice all the values are in hertz. So in terms of frequency, how much is the separation between the, the peaks as they split? So when you split the peak into a doublet, what's the difference between the, the peaks that make up the doublet? If you split the peak into a triplet, you know, what's the difference between the individual peaks that make up that triplet and so on and so forth? Um, and the value is going to tell you a little bit about the, the overall interaction that you're dealing with. So your typical alkanes, uh, that interaction happens to be around 6 to 8 hertz. And that's your typical value for you know, the alkane um, H to H coupling constants. When you're looking at your aromatics, if the hydrogens are next door, they tend to have a greater interaction simply because they are closer together. So you have a 6 to 10 hertz uh, coupling constant interaction. Whereas if the hydrogens are you know, two positions away, or I guess you could say one, two, three, so three carbons, you know, away from each other, um, then the interaction is lessened down to one to three hertz. So you could use that information to tell, you know, which hydrogens you're talking about when it comes down to the aromatic uh, molecule. And uh, with alkene, something else is also um, interesting to notice in respect to the specific configuration of that alkene or the stereoisomerism because as you well know by now alkenes can be in the trans configuration they could also be in the cis configuration or they could even be geminal like in the case we have the two groups on the same carbon of the alkene now what turns out to happen is that for the trans configuration the coupling constant is the highest we're talking about 12 to 18 which is higher than any of the other ones that we've shown so far uh, the cis configuration is, you know, less of an interaction, and then the geminal is the lowest. And the way you can explain this difference is by looking at the homolumo interaction of these orbitals. So let me try to show you that right now. If you consider the CH bond right here as being the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, then you're going to have an anti-bonding orbital. Uh, technically, this should be... Um, this should not be um, a bold orbital. This should be completely, you know, blank. But anyway, this is the supposed to be the anti-bonding orbital. Now, next to that CH bond, you have the other CH bond right here, which acts as the highest occupied molecular orbital. And the HOMO is providing electron density to the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. And because they are parallel to each other, the, the symmetry of this molecule is perfect for that interaction and since the symmetry is great for the interaction you have the highest j coupling constant now if you compare that to the cis configuration well now i'm putting the hydrogens pointing down just to make it easier on the diagram um, now one of the hydrogens will be the lumo orbital the other ch bond will be the highest occupied molecular orbital and you have to have electron density supply from the homo to the lumo and you can see here that these orbitals don't line up very well. And even if they do, notice that the lowest electron density region of the orbital is what's available to the HOMO. So this is not a great interaction. And as a result, you get a lower coupling constant for that interaction. And then by the time you get to the geminal case, well, this uh, anti-bonding and the bonding orbitals are pretty much orthogonal to each other. So you're gonna get an even lesser interaction. So by paying attention to the frontier orbitals, you can actually, you know, decently enough explain what's going on. All right, now, uh, that being said, let's keep an eye out on these values, right? So 12 to 18, roughly speaking, trans, 
6 to 12 sys, 0 to 3 is your sys, uh, you know, or your geminal configuration. All right, so we have uh, three isomeric molecules right here. If, in fact, they are pretty much the same in terms of what's connected to what. You have your nitrile groups on the ends, you have two alkenes in the middles, but the difference is that this molecule right here is trans and trans, this one right here is cis and cis, and then this one right here is cis and trans. So we have three possible isomers for this diene molecule. And in order to figure out um, which one of these three we are dealing with, you know, when we look at the NMR spectrum, it can be a little bit daunting and difficult to figure out which of the molecules this corresponds to. We, sometimes we can make a little bit of a on an assessment based on how many peaks, right? And, and based on the shape of the peaks. But um, yeah, right now it's a little bit difficult to figure out which one we're dealing with, right? So uh, first thing that we're gonna pay attention is that there are these two peaks. Uh, each one of them is pretty much split into a doublet. And what that means is that you have to have two hydrogens that are next to a carbon that contains a hydrogen. Now that's actually true for all of them, right? Because the black hydrogens right here, the ones on the extreme are next to one hydrogen only. Uh, and that applies to all of the molecules. But the one thing that we have identified conclusively is that these pigs, because they are doublets, they can only be the hydrogens on the end since those hydrogens happen to be next to a carbon that only contains one hydrogen. That is not true of the red hydrogens because the red hydrogens are on a carbon that is next to one and another carbon that contains hydrogen. So you have the red hydrogens next to two carbons that have inequivalent hydrogens, right? So these peaks could not possibly be doublets if we were dealing with the red hydrogens. So we know right now, just because these are doublets, that it has to be the out hydrogens, the ones that are like the farthest out in the molecule. And then what that means is that the ones right here that are greater multiplicity, <clears throat> they look like multiplets or triplets they must be the inner hydrogens in the molecule. So that we, that much we can tell. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna label each one of the hydrogens. So I'm calling, okay, so we're calling this the HA, HB, HC, HD. Notice that in the molecule right here, this is HA and that's HA. And the reason why is because this molecule has a, uh, an axis of rotation, specifically right here in the middle of this bond, you could rotate the molecule 180 and then this HA will, land, will basically end up exactly in the location where the HA down here is located and vice versa. This HA down here will end up up there if you rotate this molecule by 180. Same thing for this HB. If you rotate this molecule by 180, the HB right here will end up up there. Um, and then this nitrile will end up right here. This is not true of the other two molecules because even though you can rotate this molecule by 180 on its own axis and HA will end up on HB, HD will not end up here because if HD is pointing down into the left, by the time you do a 180, it should be pointing up into the right. And so you can see that HD will line up with the nitrile group is present. And of course, that's not the same thing. Hydrogen needs to end up where hydrogen is if you're to claim that they're equivalent. So this is not equivalent. So you have four different hydrogens and the molecule right here if you do something similar analysis like we did before, if you do 180 rotation on its own axis, HA will end up on HA. HB that's pointing straight to the right, by the time you do 180, it will be pointing straight to the left. And then this nitrile group that's pointing down into the left will end up pointing up into the right. So this also contains two sets of equivalent hydrogens. So what we've done right here is basically rule out two out of the three molecules um, just based on the symmetry of the molecule. So now we know that we must be dealing with a cis-trans molecule. Okay, so that much we know. What we don't know yet is which one of the hydrogens corresponds to which peak. So we're gonna have to try to figure that out. And at face value, this may be a much more daunting you know, task than you might think, because this is kind of like a 50-50 chance. Either this is HA, or is HB and vice versa. This is HA or HB. And then these guys could be HC or HD because we know that the doublets are the hydrogens at the end of the molecule and the triplet to multiplets are the hydrogens in the middle, but it's a little bit difficult to, to kind of tell. 
Um, so here's where the Kaplan constants can actually help you a little bit because you can start looking at what the separation is in the peaks. And the thing is that you are undergoing splitting because there is a carbon next door that has hydrogens. So if you do see a coupling constant value for this peak, what that implies is that there's going to be another peak in your spectrum that will also have splitting, but that splitting is going to be identical. And the reason why is because those two peaks happen to be carbons, or excuse me, hydrogens that are, are located right next to each other. That's why they have the same coupling constant. So we can use that information to figure something out. So the fact that this peak right here and the peak down there have a coupling constant of 10 means that they have to be next to each other. And so another way to put it is that if this peak right here were to be HB, then by default, the doublet down here that has a coupling constant of 10 will have to be HC because that's how you end up with two hydrogens right next to each other. All right, before we make the true assignments though, we need to figure out a few more things. So we're gonna look at another coupling. So the coupling constant of this peak to that doublet ends up being 15. And lastly, the coupling constant of these two peaks is 11. All right, but probably the first two are gonna be more important. So um, going back to this value, 15 Hertz, the fact that this multiplet that is the farthest downfield in combination with the doublet right here gives you a value of 15 means that they have to be trans to each other and not only that but they have to be next to each other right so looking at hb next to hb you have ha but we already know that ha and hb are the peaks up here right so 15.3 will not account for hb being next to ha uh, it could account for HB being next to HC, or it could account for HA being next to HD. But because the value is 15, they have to be trans. And what you'll notice is that HB and HC are cis to each other, whereas HA and HD are trans to each other. So this value gave it away. What well, that tells you is that the peak at 7.543 has to be HA, and the peak at 5.82 ppm has to be HD. And then by the same logic, uh, you can look at the values right here at 6.92 and 5.65. The Kaplan constant is 10, which is uh, consistent with the cis configuration, uh, which would mean that 6.92 is HB and then 5.65 is HC. And so that's what we're seeing right there. Um, the peak BC is the 10 hertz, which is, you know, the cis configuration. The AD Kaplan constant is 15.3, which is the trans configuration in the spectrum. And then the peaks between HA and HB, which are trans to each other, you know, they're 11, which is a little bit on the short side uh, compared to the, the typical range, but, you know, it still follows. And compared to the, the, multiple, the multiple that you see in the peaks, that is also validation that you're looking at HA and HB. So this example, how to show you how you can use the coupling constants to figure out the specific proton in your molecule that corresponds to each one of the peaks in the spectrum. So just to kind of recap the whole thing, look out for the symmetry of the molecule to determine how many inequivalent hydrogens you have, because that number of inequivalent hydrogens equals the number of signals you're going to see in your spectrum. So that may allow you to rule out some possibilities. Then Look at your coupling constants. Uh, in the case of alkenes, you can use them to figure out this, you know, whether your molecule is in the trans, the cis, or the geminal configuration. And this can be applied for as many alkenes as there are in the molecule. All right, so with all that being said, in the next video, we're going to talk about how multiplets look like and what arises, uh, or what gives rise to multiplets looking the way they do. So see you in the next video.